So today I am going to be talking about trauma-focused treatment for PTSD. Um, my background, I have a specialty background in both um, clinical and research in the area of trauma and PTSD. Before I came to Maine, I was at the National Center for PTSD as part of the Boston VA. Um, and so I was mostly doing research there, but I was doing um, some clinical work in the PTSD clinic of the VA, but I've worked with um, civilians as well. And a good chunk of my caseload now um, is trauma and PTSD, I would say maybe about half at this point. Um, so it's something that I continue to enjoy with a little balance. I think having a full trauma caseload can be challenging for reasons we'll talk about. Um, so yeah, feel free to jump in if people have questions at any point. Um, and we'll, we'll just get going and see where the discussion takes us. All right, so I just wanted to give a little background about just trauma and PTSD as a diagnosis. As we all know, trauma is really common. Um, at least half of US adults in the US experience a Criterion A DSM trauma. And especially in the context of COVID, right, I think we're going to see more um, kind of COVID related trauma, whether it be um, you know, medical workers, people that potentially have had COVID or have lost um, lost people in kind of sudden and unexpected ways. And so, you know, it's something that's always been really prevalent, but I think, you know, especially we may be seeing more of it coming in in the, the coming months, given the context of the pandemic. Prevalence studies vary quite a bit, um, but usually lifetime risk covers around 7 to 8%. Um, and, you know, we see higher rates for various populations like um, veterans, for example, have a have a higher risk of um, getting PTSD. And of course, trauma has been around for a really long time. People have talked about it for a really long time. Kind of the the effects of it have been around for um, many, many years. PTSD has been referred to by many different names. Um, but PTSD as a diagnosis is pretty young. It was, it only became an official diagnosis in 1980. And unlike most other disorders in the DSM, the recognition of PTSD really came from converging social movements um, as opposed to kind of academic, clinical, or scientific initiatives. So the, the Vietnam War was a big, um, kind of accelerant in PTSD becoming a diagnosis, as was kind of the women's rights movement um, and kind of those kind of converged in a way to, to result in PTSD being put in the DSM in 1980, which it hadn't been before. And I think that's important to highlight because PTSD is a controversial diagnosis, you know, because it's newer, there's, you know, the, the concentrated um, kind of empirical research is maybe a little bit younger. And so there's, there are certainly very different camps of thinking in terms of how to conceptualize and treat PTSD. And I think that's important to keep in mind, you know, as we see this in our clients as well. So that's kind of why I wanted to bring it up there. Um, so I wanted to start, you know, there's, there's a lot of different aspects we can talk about. Here we're going to be talking about PTSD treatment for adults. And this is adults that already have established PTSD or who are post-trauma, right? So we there's a lot we could talk about in terms of kind of prevention or early intervention, but this is kind of once, once people have experienced the trauma and are experiencing kind of after effects of that, what are the treatments that would be helpful? And so the, the recommendations um, that I'm presenting come from the ISTSS guidelines, the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, um, have a references or a resources page at, at the end um, and they're on it. That's a really helpful resource in terms of treating trauma and PTSD. Um, and so this is from their kind of official guidelines of um, what treatments have a strong enough evidence base to be strongly recommended. And so as of now, the strongly supported treatments or the treatments with kind of the most empirical support behind them are cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure, EMDR, individual CBT with a trauma focus and cognitive therapy. Um, and so I'm guessing people are generally familiar. Um, if you're not kind of, if you haven't had um, experience administering any of these treatments, at least kind of being familiar with hearing about them, um, kind of the the gold standards um, that have been rolled out nationwide in the VA are CBT and PE. Um, 
and um, and then you know EMDR tends to be more available. I would say more in um, like non VA clinical contexts that tends to be a bit more common, and then CBT with um, trauma focus and cognitive therapy. There's a lot of overlap kind of between these different treatments. Um, cognitive therapy for PTSD is really focusing on kind of the identification and modification of the negative appraisals and behavior. So very um, focused in the cognitive aspect and interpretation of kind of self-related cognitions around kind of guilt and shame, which is very um, similar to CPT. CPT just kind of has um, added added aspects of, um, of more of kind of the exposure piece as well. And um, prolonged exposure also has a, a strong exposure component. We'll talk a little bit more about those um, later on. Um, I have the little um, whiteboard videos, which I'll show, which, which I find to be helpful actually in um, engaging people with treatment at times. Um, EMDR is also exposure-based. It involves kind of the, the use of physical stimulation in terms of um, kind of eye movements with the moving the finger or taps or tones. Um, the mechanism is still thought to be exposure. Um, so kind of exposure being a, a prominent theme um, in, in PTSD treatment. And, um, and generally the evidence base for individual treatment for PTSD for um, adults is good, right? It's it's pretty effective, it's pretty helpful, um, but I will say trauma treatments are hard, right? They're good, they're generally effective, but they're hard to go through, right? Being exposed to the trauma often repeatedly is a really challenging thing to do. It takes a lot of um, kind of motivation and, um, and also time and effort, which people don't necessarily have. Um, like I definitely noticed when I was at the VA, the younger veterans that had kind of jobs and more family responsibilities, it was a lot harder for them to engage in treatment because, you know, often these treatments are involving homework um, over the course of the week. And so thinking about, you know, how to, how to make sure that um, people have the time and space and effort to engage with that, let alone just the emotional content and impact of it, which is obviously intense, right? You're asking someone to kind of go back and revisit the worst thing that has happened to them. Um, so those are definitely some challenges. Dropout tends to be decently high in, um, in some of these treatments just because they're, they're pretty effective, but they're hard to tolerate um, in a lot of cases. One thing that I will also mention is um, the trauma-focused treatment can really be helpful and useful in cases that don't necessarily meet full criteria for PTSD. Um, so, you know, there's again, a lot of controversy around what constitutes like a DSM-5 criterion, a traumatic event um, and, you know, imminent threat of physical harm um, is typically kind of the, the kind of underlying factor. Um, you know, there's also um, sexual violence or threat of sexual violence, but something like, for example, emotional abuse actually doesn't fall under criterion A for PTSD, but certainly I think we've, we've all worked with individuals who um, have experienced emotional abuse and have kind of had serious trauma reactions as a result. And so these treatments certainly can be helpful in those contexts as well. Um, you know, with a background in research, you know, there's a lot of kind of strict adherence to DSM-5 criteria, obviously, but, you know, we have a little bit more room in clinical practice to be able to make some space, um, you know, for people that don't perfectly fit into, into that mold. Um, and so these are the kind of most strongly supported treatments. Like I said, I'll talk a little bit more about CPT and PE a little bit later on. Um, I also thought it was interesting to include some of these interventions with emerging evidence. So basically there is um, some evidence based here, but because they're newer, they just haven't built up the um, quite the, the impact of evidence base that for that the strongly supported treatments have. And some of these, you know, couple CBT with a trauma focus um, was involved with a with a trial um, involving couples, it's an interesting model, especially because PTSD really does impact the family unit. I mean, mental illness in general impacts the family unit, but um, 
you know, looking at it from kind of that broader perspective of the couple as opposed to just the individual, both group and individual CBT with the trauma focus, um, reconsolidation of trauma memories, single session CBT. Um, WET is an interesting one, written exposure therapy. It was um, actually developed by my mentor and supervisor when I was on postdoc, Brian Marks, um, and his wife, Denise Sloan. They're both PTSD researchers at the National Center. And WET is a really interesting one because it's, it's exposure-based, but it's, um, it's mostly writing where the therapist actually is not present or involved for a good deal of the sessions. It's, um, it's really the, the client is instructed to write about, you know, the most traumatic event. And then there's a little bit of processing after, but the majority is the client kind of writing in session and then talking about it. It's also um, shorter than the typical kind of 10 to 12 sessions we see for a lot of the other EBTs. Um, and it's, it's developing a pretty good evidence base anecdotally in terms of my use of it, I found it really helpful for people that maybe aren't quite sold on diving into one of the kind of more intense, um, like CBT or PE, more deep dive um, exposure-based, um, discussion exposure-based therapies. And it can be helpful to kind of get your feet wet in a sense um, to be able to then, and some for some people, wet may be all they need, but when I, um, in my experience, I worked with more kind of tr chronic trauma survivors, um, kind of more deeply ingrained PTSD symptoms, what has kind of been kind of a, a nice um, kind of gateway therapy of getting people kind of into the concept of exposure therapy and then um, opening them up maybe to a more intensive treatment like CPT or PE. Um, virtual reality is also a really neat um, therapy that that is gaining more traction and evidence base. Um, you know, obviously there are there are logistical batter, barriers in terms of equipment, um, but it's kind of putting on a headset and then kind of doing the exposure of being put back in the in the traumatic environment. Um, and this has been really helpful for like, for example, combat traumas, um, or I know it's been used a lot in 9-11 traumas as well. And these are helpful because obviously there's a lot of um, time and effort that goes into kind of creating the, the context and the scenario. And for every individual client, it's kind of tailored to their particular experience. Um, but having kind of a general script and um, kind of environment programmed for these, these trauma scenarios and then kind of doing exposure, putting on the goggles and going back in. Um, I, um, there's been a lot of work out of Atlanta and New York City around virtual reality, and especially now with kind of emerging technology, it's becoming a little bit more accessible. You know, in the beginning, it was really expensive, cost prohibitive, and now it's becoming a little bit more accessible. Um, I went to a conference once where they passed around kind of the, the VR goggles and you got to put them on, and it's neat. It, you know, it kind of feels like you're back in the scenario. Um, and so that's kind of a, a neat, again, exposure-based um, intervention as well um, that is kind of gaining more, more research base. So I just threw a lot of information at everyone. I just wanted to check in um, if there are any questions so far. Kelly, I have a question about the written exposure therapy. So is this something that like the protocol is um, available or is it um, something that's not super structured, but like that you could, I mean, I, I'm just wondering if that, um, if it's something that I should just kind of look up or if there are certain guidelines that you could probably just know and then use it with people. That's a great question. There is a manual. And I'm not sure, I'll have to check on the status of publication because the one I have is like their draft one before it was officially published that was just circulated internally when I was at the VA because I was working with them, but they've published on it now. So it's available in some context. Um, I'm not sure if it's open source, but I'll check on that and get back to you. It's, you know, it's not super structured, but it does kind of give you specific instructions in terms of kind of how to set them up for the writing prompts. And there's different writing prompts for different sessions. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so I'll look into it and I'll get back to you. Actually. Thank you. Yeah, of course. If I forget any other questions. That was my question as well. It's kind of how, how structured it is and if there are specific prompts, yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, like the kind of one of their conceptualizations was in terms of like thera therapist um, kind of availability, like to, I think one of the initial visions was to have like several different clients doing it kind of simultaneously and having the therapist, the therapist is there, you know, just for a smaller portion of the therapy hour. So being able to kind of work with different clients and kind of increase accessibility to services in that way. Um, so it's, it's an interesting concept. Like I said, I found it, it does have good evidence base behind it, but anecdotally, I found it to be kind of a, a good first step that usually isn't the end of the road in trauma treatment. Kelly. Yeah. It, it also reminded me of like community acupuncture, right? Where you can meet and there's several people in several rooms. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's definitely a different model in terms of trauma-focused treatment. And funny you mentioned actually acupuncture. We'll talk about that momentarily. Um, okay. But yeah, it's I mean, starting with like the gold standards of CPT and PE, right? The, these treatments are good. They're they're generally effective, but they're so hard and um, and they're not effective for everyone, right? So I think. Um, there's been understandably a big focus in kind of how we can improve efficacy of treatment, but also um, kind of make it improve efficacy while also making it easier for people to go through these treatments just because it's, it's a hard thing. Mm. Mm. All right. So I just wanted to briefly talk about pharmacotherapy. Obviously that's not what we do, um, but just kind of wanted to put a slide out on this so people are kind of aware of um, of kind of where the evidence base stands. So right now there are four medications that um, that do have an evidence base, but as you notice, they're listed in the guidelines as interventions with low effect, right? So they certainly can be helpful and they are prescribed fluoxetine, peroxetine, sertraline, and venlafaxine, or Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, and Effexor. Um, but we see a definite kind of difference in terms of therapy tends to have um, a much better impact and much better effect for people than medications. Um, Quetiapine or Seroquel has emerging evidence, doesn't have a really strong evidence base. And then you can see a whole list of things that there's not enough evidence to recommend. Um, so this is this has definitely been a challenge looking at pharmacotherapy interventions for PTSD. Um, Prazosin isn't listed in the guidelines, but it, it does have um, demonstrated effect, but not for PTSD broadly, for nightmares specifically. And so that's often something um, that you'll see people prescribed with, with PTSD. Um, trazodone also not for PTSD specifically, but of surrounding sleep, um, that's a pretty common one as well. All right. So I wanted to spend a minute talking about, it's listed as non-psychological and non-pharmacological treatment. So kind of this other category and again, a lot of this is newer research. So um, kind of the, the strongest evidence category is interventions with emerging evidence. And so that's where we see acupuncture, um, neurofeedback, and um, that's an interesting one. It's kind of like biofeedback, but you know, you're looking at displays of brain activity that then help you learn to kind of self-regulate brain activity in a way. I'm not super familiar with it, but it's, it's an inter interesting concept. Obviously, um, there's some equipment involved in that one. Um, I, I am not going to attempt to pronounce um, the next intervention because it, I am going to butcher it, but um, it is a Japanese herbal medicine that is showing some, um, some evidence base there. Um, somatic experiencing is focusing on perceived body sensations, 
and kind of working on learning to regulate these with the aim of resolving symptoms. So it's kind of a symptom-based intervention. Um, there's some kind of very new work on TMS um, using magnetic fields to, to stimulate nerve cells in targeted areas of the brain, um, non-invasive, repeated. And there's also some neat work on yoga for PTSD. Um, Bessel van der Kolk has done some, some neat studies there um, and kind of the, the mind-body connection. Um, and there's, there's also kind of trauma-informed yoga programs, um, which, which are showing to be helpful as well. So those are kind of coming up. Um, and there's also some interventions that, that there's not enough evidence to recommend either, um, you know, negative effects are just not strong enough of an, of an evidence base. And you'll see some, um, some mindfulness pieces in there. So group mindfulness, um, MBSR is another one. Mindfulness is an interesting one in the context of PTSD because it certainly can be helpful, but it can also be potentially triggering, right? I think we, or maybe, um, not as clinicians, although sometimes I think I certainly fall into this trap of thinking as of mindfulness as this very calming, peaceful experience, but it it certainly isn't always, and especially for someone with PTSD, um, with kind of really intense um, intrusion symptoms, for example, or hypervigilance, um, mindfulness can be can be certainly a real challenge. And so there is um, oh. There's another treatment I was going to talk about, but that's not the next slide. This is um, this is a link to the whiteboard video for CPT. I thought we could just watch it and look at it. It's like two minutes long. And basically the National Center for PTSD has these little short, um, they're called whiteboard videos. It's like kind of cartoon based videos about, they have it for like, what is PTSD? What is evidence-based treatment? They have one for CPT and PE. Um, and sometimes I find them helpful in treatment to just kind of show someone to say like, this is kind of the gist of this treatment, um, kind of engaging in a way and, you know, it's, it's designed, um, for the VA system, but I think it also, you know, it's not exclusive to combat trauma and I think it can, um, it can be, I found it helpful in my clinical work. So I'll just go ahead and play it and then, oops, can go from there. All right. Let's see, hold on, I have to figure out how to get this over. All right, can everyone see that now? Yep, we can see oh, it. Okay, sorry. And there we go. A traumatic event can change the way you think about yourself and the world. You might think you're to blame for what happened or believe you don't deserve to be happy. You may start to believe the world is unsafe. Doing things like going to a grocery store or restaurant may seem too dangerous. These kinds of thoughts are common in people with post-traumatic stress. Sorry, what? It's unfortunately not playing, but we can hear it. But the visual oh. hasn't changed. Yeah. It might be sometimes when you do screen share, you have to like optimize it for um, sound. Hold on. You might have to do it for video too. I think there's there's two boxes, one for sound and one for video. Yeah. Sneaky. All right, hold on. Let me stop the share for a sec. Oh, optimize screen sharing for video clip. I didn't know use about that, Kate. I knew about the sound, but I somehow it always works. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why. Already somebody up. told somebody told it to me, and I just try to pass it on to others. Excellent. Okay, so I'm, if I share my second screen, then we should be okay when I go back to the PowerPoint. We'll give it a shot and see how, what happens. All right. Can everyone see it now? Mm -hmm. Okay. A traumatic event can change the way you think about yourself and the world. You might think you're to blame for what happened or believe you don't deserve to be happy. You may start to believe the world is unsafe. Doing things like going to a grocery store or restaurant may seem too dangerous. These kinds of thoughts are common in people with post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. They're called stuck points. They keep you stuck in your PTSD and cause you to miss out on the people, places, or activities you used to enjoy. So how do you get unstuck? <laughs> 
Cognitive Processing Therapy, or CPT, is a PTSD treatment that can help you break the negative thinking that's holding you back. It's based on the idea that our thoughts affect how we feel and how we act. In CPT, you and your therapist will talk about how your negative thoughts about the trauma, those stuck points, have changed you, how safe and in control you feel, how much you trust yourself and others, and even your sense of self-worth. You'll practice a strategy to change or challenge your stuck points. PTSD can make you jump to negative conclusions, but there may be other ways to think about things that are more accurate and less upsetting. Imagine you're driving down the highway and someone swerves in front of you. You might blow up at the driver. What a jerk. But what if he was racing to the hospital or having a panic attack and rushing to get off the road? If you consider these possibilities, you might not feel as angry. The bottom line, small changes in thinking can have a big impact on how you feel. Some people find that writing about their trauma helps them change upsetting thoughts and feelings. You and your therapist can decide whether or not this is right for you. CPT works just as well either way. You can also choose to meet with your therapist one-on-one -on -one or in a group with others who have PTSD. CPT is evidence-based, meaning it's been shown to work in multiple research studies. And it doesn't take years. In fact, CPT usually takes about three months of weekly visits. CPT can help you get unstuck, freeing you up to start enjoying the things you've been missing out on. Men and women, veterans and civilians can all benefit from CPT. If cognitive processing therapy sounds like it could be right for you, talk to your doctor about finding a CPT provider or visit the National Center for PTSD website at www.ptsd.va.gov to learn more about CPT and other PTSD treatments. No matter how long you've been living with PTSD, know that you can get better. Can you all see my slides again? Oops. I don't know what I just did. I think we're seeing presenter yeah. view now. All right. Oh, dear. <laughs> Trying to navigate the technology, but now I've lost the Zoom meeting, so I can't find you all. <laughs> oh, we're hidden behind something, probably. Struggles. <laughs> all right you, <laughs> give me just a minute here I'm figuring if you out. stop your screen oh i see there. this up there okay there yeah. we go yeah. <laughs> oh man all right now if i share my slide that should all right are we good perfect okay and now we're back at the beginning but whatever all right um so that was a lot of drama, but I hope I hope you enjoyed the video clip. Um, you know, like I said, I think this is a nice introduction. There's some really interesting research around CPT. Um, like they did a dismantling study and found that the the writing of the trauma narrative, so writing about what actually happened, um, doesn't kind of significantly add to the effect of the treatment. And so that's why in the video they talk about you know how you can write about it or not. Um, people, you know, it depends on the person. Some people like to kind of have the writing of the trauma narrative, even though people tend to find that um, to be a pretty challenging aspect of the treatment. It can also be a really relevant one. If you don't write about it, you're still obviously talking about the trauma a lot. You're just not focusing on kind of um, going back to the narrative. And then there's also some interesting research on um, the variability and length of CPT. So like the, the manual says 12 sessions, but um, kind of emerging evidence showing like gauging how people are doing at the end of the 12 sessions and whether it would be beneficial to add a few sessions at the end to go back um, just because there's a lot of, there's a lot of different kind of skills and aspects that are covered. Um, I like CPT a lot. There are a lot of worksheets involved with it. There's a lot of paperwork, but, um, but it's, you know, it's pretty helpful for people and, um, and, you know, once you get into the swing of it, it's a little bit easier to manage the paperwork, although I have not done it since we went to virtual, so screen sharing would definitely um, need to be involved for that. Um, all right, and then that we could also just, maybe we won't watch the PE one, um, I'll 
send the slides out and you all can watch them it's in my references page as well but it's a similar kind of two minute video about prolonged exposure um you know pe again manualized typically about 10 sessions but up to 15. um it was designed for 90 minute sessions but kind of research has come out showing that 60 minute sessions are also um fine it can be modified to that which is helpful because you know a lot of clinicians are working on the therapy hour and it's hard to um to get more than that again there's weekly homework and kind of the the um impetus for pe is that kind of avoiding trauma reminders maintains ptsd symptoms trauma related distress and pe kind of addresses the avoidance um through emotional processing of the trauma memories um so engaging in imaginal exposure in session going over the um the traumatic event so identifying a particular memory and kind of going over that in session and then in vivo exposure um, for homework so creating a hierarchy of uh, fear and avoided situations and um and kind of working on that outside of session and to kind of challenge um that avoidance both internal of the the trauma itself and um you know people places situations associated with the trauma and again um really helpful um but it's a lot right diving into kind of um going through the the trauma memory repeatedly is really challenging um and people really have a hard time usually with the initial um imaginal exposure and then you know as we see with exposure it gets a lot easier over time um all right Kelly, can I ask a question, Julie? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think these videos are great. And I'm curious, because it sounds like the VA has really put forth both CPT and CE as the gold standard approaches. And yet, like, as you mentioned, kind of in the civilian world, it still feels like EMDR, it gets more play time, like even mm -hmm. when we get referrals from PCPs, it seems like they're more familiar with EMDR and might not even know about CE. Yeah. And, CPT. and I'm just wondering what your perspective is on that. Yeah, I mean, dissemination and access to training is a big part of it, right? I think, you know, the National Center is through the VA and they've done this huge role out of, you know, providing this training for, you know, everyone within that context, but it's a lot less available for people in kind of the, the civilian world. And, um, and it's involved, right? I, I am a CPT certified therapist, and in order to do that, I had to do weekly supervision for months and kind of get a certain number of people through CPT successfully with reduction of symptoms, right? And that's that's something that most people that are just kind of operating as um, clinicians outside of the VA don't have access to. And so I think EMDR is much more accessible in that way. Um, I also think because people have less experience with these particularly prolonged exposure, I found um, there's kind of this like hesitancy to kind of put someone through this um, and kind of a fear of like, you know, there's sometimes therapists um, concern about engaging in these treatments. Um, I kind of had a different path into this world. So my first post-college job was um, being the lab coordinator for a uh, prolonged exposure versus the loft um, RCT. And that's actually what helped me in um, trauma and PTSD research was like seeing these people that had been suffering for so long, right? The average time between trauma and seeking treatment, I think on average is about 12 years, right? So it tends to be pretty chronic and seeing people get so much better in a 10-week period was just like it blew my mind and it's like okay i want to i want to be involved with this but it is a really intense treatment you kind of have to have that knowledge so i think that's another piece of it sometimes clinicians are hesitant to you know engage in training and then the training is hard to get um and people have a hard time finding it so i think those are kind of two big barriers but I think now that it really has been rolled out well in the VA system, I think they're trying to think about how to make it more accessible to people kind of outside of the VA system to, to disseminate it and implement it more broadly. I don't know. I know other people are kind of in the, the trauma treatment realm. Any other thoughts that anyone else wants to kick in with? 
I always thought it was surprising how popular EMDR is. Uh, it's, I didn't know if it was just a main thing or not, but it's not. It's not I, I just thought it was strange that um, it seems like grad programs now do not even do any training in EMDR. So it's to me, I, I kind of view it as just like it's kind of outdated. Like there's not, and, and from my understanding, it's pretty expensive to even get that training. Like, so it was interesting. I think Kelly, I mean, everything she's saying makes a lot of sense. And at the same time, I wonder where do these people get the EMDR training as well? Like, I don't know where that comes from, but it's, it's a mystery. Yeah, it is a good question, um, but it like, it has to be more accessible because there's a lot of like master's level clinicians that are EMDR. Yeah, trained. that must be it. Yep. Um, in the like the social working world, maybe that's more popular. Yeah. 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 And you know, there's there's kind of been a historical tension between like CPT and PE and EMDR. But I mean, EMDR does have good evidence base. But you know, I've had clients ask me about it, and I'm like, you know, no, I'm I'm not trained in that, and I don't do it. But you know, some people find it really helpful, um, and and that's true. But I mean, at its core, it's exposure with an added element, which you know, if wondered, is just like the distraction of the the finger movement or the tones or whatever it is, kind of allowing someone maybe to to engage with exposure in a way that like feels a little more contained. I don't know. Um, yeah, EMDR is kind of a mystery to me as well. I don't have training in it, so I can't really speak intelligently about it, but it does have good evidence. Other thoughts or questions? So there is another treatment that I wanted to talk a little bit about because um, it's very involved in my world and that is MDMA assisted psychotherapy. Um, so my other job is I am an independent contractor for the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Um, I do training and reliability for their assessments. Um, so like CAPS, the gold standard PTSD assessment, and then mini skid PD, so um, you know baseline eligibility. I train the the assessors that are doing the um, the assessments for these trials, and then I review the recordings for reliability. And so, and the assisted psychotherapy is an interesting one. It's a lot newer, right? So, um, so it's it's a combination of psychopharm, but also talk therapy, right? And um, it was based on the trials. It was awarded breakthrough therapy designation in August 2017. And so it moved into phase three trials, which are going on now, and provided the results of those phase three trials match the evidence that has been shown thus far. Then it's looking to um, be legalized as a treatment by the FDA. And so um, the, the organization that I contract with is um, currently doing this research. And so what it involves is um, about 15 sessions total. Um, about the, there's most of them are non-drug, so non-MDMA um, sessions. And then there's three MDMA sessions. The, the 12 non-MDMA sessions look very similar to talk therapy. They're a little bit longer, they're about 90 minutes. And it's kind of um, preparing for the MDMA sessions and then kind of processing those sessions after the fact. Um, and then the MDMA sessions are longer. They're about three to five weeks apart. And that's like a day long where um, the, the client is in the, the therapy office with a team. So it's always two therapists that are um, kind of overseeing the administration and um, processing of the MDMA experience. Um, and so the, the current phase three study, it's a randomized double blind placebo controlled multi-site, I think there's 16 sites now, um, looking to recruit about two to 300 uh, people with PTSD. Um, most of us, I think 11 or 12 sites are in the US and then 
Um, there are additional sites in Canada, Israel, Netherlands, Czech Republic, and then we're just starting one in Norway soon. Um, and it's a it's an interesting model, um, right? Kind of the proposed mechanism is that the MDMA, which is um, the active component in ecstasy, but in it's a small dose, right? So it's much smaller than anyone would take recreationally. And it kind of the proposed mechanism is that it in it decreases um, activation of the amygdala to be able to allow processing of the trauma. So one of kind of the challenges for people, like I was saying, with the exposure-based therapies is that they get so kind of overwhelmed by, um, you know, intrusion symptoms that it's, it's hard to tolerate the distress to be able to process the trauma. And so the kind of proposed mechanism here is that the MDMA kind of dampens that amygdala response down to allow kind of processing with the trauma. Um, and it's interesting, you know, it's not manualized in the way PE and CPT are because, you know, with the MDMA experience, there's, you know, it's a, it's a lot harder to kind of set that, um, that agenda rigidly in that way. Um, but it's kind of, it's understood that if the client doesn't bring up the trauma in the session, that the therapists will. But anecdotally from the, the research thus far that I've heard from the researchers, it's come up um, kind of um, organically led by the, the client. And thus far, it seems like the dropout rate seems to be quite a bit lower than for the other treatments. So very new, but um, kind of a, a, neat, a neat potential um, addition to to the field of trauma treatment and you know we're we're a ways off obviously looking at the the results of these trials and then legalization and then roll out and kind of what that looks like broadly but it's been an interesting trial to be to be a part of i've been working with them for the last few years and it's um kind of been interesting to be a part of this research especially in a context that i feel like is um kind of culturally evolving in our kind of views of um psychedelics and, um, you know, other drugs. Like I've been, I've done some cannabis trials as well for PTSD. Um, and when I was at Bowdoin teaching, just like seeing the shift just in students' reactions to this kind of research has been really interesting just in the last few years. So, um, so yeah, just wanted to throw that in there, um, you know, because it's so new, it, it doesn't have the evidence base that the other treatments do, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Any questions about that? about the MDMA assisted. Just you mentioned legalization and I, I thought I remembered there's actually some therapists in Portland that are already rolling this out. Or might I be thinking about ketamine or is that, uh, I guess I'm just. Yeah, so there's there's been a lot more ketamine research okay. certainly. Um, and sorry, I was not saying something. No, I was just saying, yeah, I think that that is what I'm thinking of, actually, but I don't know if you're if that's further along in terms of research. Efficacy. Yeah, I'm not sure what the status we haven't done any ketamine trials. There's been a lot of ketamine for depression. Um, I know there's not enough evidence base of ketamine for PTSD, although I think there are some trials that have happened. But I think similarly, it's it's relatively early on, though I know less about kind of the specifics of the mechanism for ketamine in terms of treatment. Does anyone else know? I don't know with ketamine. I do remember, maybe this is what you were thinking about, Julie. I want to say it was maybe Larry Fishman. One of the psychiatrists in the area was looking for a, a psychologist to pair with to do this MDA, MDMA assisted psychotherapy for trauma. And I don't know if it, he must have been part of a, of a trial because I, yeah, I don't think he'd be able to. I think he wanted that. to join the MAPS program. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I remember, Julie, you sent the email and I was like, hey, I work for them. Yeah, uh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, so, yeah, I remember that. But there's also, um, I think, a LCPC and a psychiatrist and another doctor teaming up. Uh, I'll share the website with you, Kelly, what I'm yeah. thinking of, but very, very new and trying to get this going. One of the, it may, not, it may be ketamine, but just the cost of it, I think, has been a real struggle right to figure out how to make it work for people yeah so. yeah and i mean there's certainly a lot of barriers aside from you know obviously most importantly proving that the treatment is effective and safe but then you know 
rolling it out, getting people the training they need, um, you know, manufacturing of the the drug. That's been a, certainly a research challenge. Um, but you know, I'm hopeful that things may shift more, as you know, with time. But it's you know certainly an interesting avenue of research, one that I've enjoyed being a part of. Are, are um, you still looking for participants or is it basically closed? No, so um, the first phase of the, or I shouldn't say phase because that has a specific research meaning, the first kind of half of the phase three trial was supposed to end, I think, over the summer, but because of COVID, it ended early. So they were looking to recruit 100 people and they stopped at 90 and stopped at like in like March when everything shut down. And then the second part just started like a, maybe two months ago. Um, some of the, there's like, you know, 12 different sites in the US and they've, you know, depending on COVID restrictions, they've kind of been opening back up at different times. Um, so they're they are getting going now um, and things have been quite busy, although a lot more of the visits are being done virtually to minimize COVID exposure, but obviously, the NDMA assisted sessions are and need to be done in person. I have a client who I think could really benefit from this, but it sounds like chances of that working out at this point in time is very low. The closest site to here is Boston. So yeah, that would, be, that would be a lot of travel. Yeah. Interestingly, uh, the PI at that site is Bessel van der Kolk. So some, some trauma connections, um, which is Funny, I was mentioning trauma camps. Like I come from, you know, the um, the more kind of CBT world, like DSM-based conceptualization. And Bessel has a definitely very different. It's more of like the chronic complex trauma, more um, you know, repressed memories being the norm. Kind of um, there's been there's been quite a bit of tension. So it's interesting now that I'm working with him in that context interesting politics of the, the trauma and PTSD world. All right, so I think I'm almost done. Oh, um, one thing I wanted to talk about is kind of things that I think about in picking a trauma-focused treatment. Um, and so there, are, there, there is research being done as to guide what treatment might be helpful for who, but that hasn't really existed in the past and that's kind of newer. And so a lot of it is client preference, right? Talking about, you know, obviously what you're trained in or what's available and then talking to them about what they think and kind of um, making sure they, you know, there aren't misconceptions about this or that, or, you know, figuring out, just talking to them and seeing what they want. Um, you know, motivation and willingness is just an important piece of any trauma-focused treatment because as we know, trauma-focused treatment is hard, right? It's it's certainly a challenge and requires um, kind of the emotional bandwidth to engage in session, but most um, most treatments also involve kind of that homework in between. So making sure that the, the psychoeducation is there and the rationale for treatment and, you know, making sure that they have time um, to do it. Um, you know, often, well, when I was at the VA and kind of the two main treatments we we offered were CBT and PE, um, kind of the, when thinking about that dichotomy, I tend to think about behavioral avoidance, right? If someone has a lot of behavioral avoidance and that's kind of prominent in their presentation, I tend to lean towards PE because that tends to focus on the behavioral avoidance piece. Um, whereas kind of with the, the stuck points around like secondary emotions like shame and guilt, that tends to lead me more towards CPT. Um, again, this is this is just kind of anecdotally and what I've found helpful in working with clients. If people tend to be more hesitant about trauma-focused treatment at all, you know, sometimes what, like I said, can be a first um, kind of step into the trauma-focused treatment world. Um, and then, you know, going from there. But those are those are kind of some of the pieces that that I think about, and I'm curious, I know there's there's other kind of um, people that do trauma-focused treatment, and I'm curious if there are other pieces that, that you think about, um, if anyone has anything they, in addition, that they think about when, when picking a particular treatment. Mm 
I mean, I'm, I'm curious because you've um, presented empirically validated treatments and yet we come across a lot of therapists who might say they specialize in trauma treatment but haven't been trained in any of these empirically validated treatments. Would you ever make an argument for picking a treatment that isn't empirically validated or is more psychodynamic or interpersonal in focus? Um, what is your view on that? I mean, like there's certainly, there's certainly treatments that can involve trauma and can address trauma, right? When I think like trauma-focused treatment, I think about like really putting, addressing the trauma, the PTSD kind of front and center and um, working on that. And that's where I think of kind of a manualized treatment. However, you know, I certainly like, for example, now I have a client who um, she's in her seventies and intense trauma history, abuse history, um, complex presentation, like I would say BBD traits, maybe not full level, but like some, some manic kind of behavior, some dissociative behavior, all tying back to the trauma. Um, and so I think for that kind of client, I use like a general trauma informed approach of like, like some of like, for example, the, um, the trauma focused cognitive therapy techniques, right? So it's not like, that's not the, like the main focus of treatment, but it is involved and it comes up in our work a lot. And then I've talked about, you know, this is something that is out there. You know, if you were interested, we could talk more about it, right? Because, you know, I want to let someone know that these treatments exist. They tend to be pretty helpful, um, but it takes kind of a commitment to think about doing them and, you know, Obviously, I, I don't want to push someone into a treatment that they don't want to do, but just kind of walking that line of like, this is here, we can dive into it more if that's something you want. Um, but, you know, this for this particular person, like the trauma has felt so off limits that just us talking about it in the context that we have with those um, trauma focused cognitive therapy techniques has been a lot, right? So, you know, with these, I would shy away from non like non empirically validated like trauma focused approaches and my um my view would be to use kind of trauma informed techniques and then you know seeing if someone wants to to do the the deeper work of trauma focused treatment because sometimes people don't want to right it's not enough of a problem it's kind of weighing um you know how intense is it and and doing psychoeducation about you know kind of some motivational interviewing kind of work around how the trauma might be impacting you. Does that make sense? Yeah, really helpful. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, sure. And then I know we're almost at the end, but I think I just have one more slide. Yes. So I just have a resources slide um, of kind of places that I go when I'm looking at um, trauma-focused treatment or looking to get more information or statistics. Um, the National Center has a really nice website well, that's supposed to say ptsd.va.gov. I'll fix that. So it, it, that's where the whiteboard videos come from. Um, like I said, ISTSS has some great resources. And then there's some apps that can be really helpful, um, like PE Coach, CPT Coach. Um, you know, I've it's not directly PTSD related, but there's a CBTI um, app that can be, be helpful since sleep problems are pretty prominent as well. Um, and so there, you know, the technology um, has evolved to, to be helpful in that way, which is especially nice thinking about, you know, this time of um, virtual meeting and, and not being able to kind of exchange papers back and forth, which all of a sudden seems very old school. <laughs> 